Hello, and welcome to another episode of We've Got Worm, the weekly podcast where we tackle the web serial worm week by week. I'm your host and resident worm expert, Matt Freeman, and I'm joined by my co-host and recent worm convert, Scott. Scott, which arc are we tackling today? We are tackling arc three, agitation. And this, Matt, is a very agitating arc in this this, uh, story. Yeah, you could almost say that the villains are agitating the heroes and that Taylor is... (laughs) agitated yeah and uh and her her journey to the dark side is is taking leaps and bounds yeah this is the things are starting to accelerate in this chapter as we'll see um i've i've definitely got a lot of questions for you this time about how you felt about certain things but before we get to that point we'll, we're going to do the audience participation section of the of the podcast um we got some some excellent comments as usual uh, I am very bad at math suggests uh, that that they enjoy it when we talk about like likes and dislikes without necessarily having to dig into why and how uh, Wildbo made the magic happen. So in other words, that we shouldn't be just uh, I'm interpreting this to mean that we shouldn't just be strictly analytical and and cold minded about it, but that we should talk about like our, our, our feelings about it. And I think that's actually very fair because, you know. As I said, as I said last time, I think like I forget to mention like, oh, yeah, and by the way, this is an extremely fun story that I enjoy greatly. It's not just something that I like to analyze uh, passively. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, where that comes from is I am a dork and I really have a lot of fun sitting down with these things and analyzing this. The prep we do for this podcast is probably some of the most fun stuff I do all week. But yeah, I think we do tend to forget that, hey, also, we don't have to explore the minute details of how xyz works we can just say this is really fun and i think this is actually a perfect comment coming into this section because um there are some stuff to dig into in arc three but for the most part this is just a really really fun arc um there's Mm -hmm. a lot of action it's just very fun so i think i'm going to try to remember that as we go through um this stuff today and just stop and say hey before we go on, this is just this is just a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I just really like this. Yeah, it's really exciting. So Reddit user Code Zeta mentions that um, we last time we had we had mentioned that all of the undersiders have what at first glance seem to be weak powers, but that not only are they probably not actually weak, but mainly they're all just very terrifying powers. There's you know bugs, darkness, monsters, and and then the psychological fears of of you know having your secrets known and having a guy who can who can take away your control of your body. Um, so these are obviously um, this is obviously perfectly true. And and in fact, now that this is pointed out to me, I can't help but think that this was done on purpose to make like the most terrifying uh, supervillain team. Um, and it's also funny to me that Taylor doesn't seem to think of it this way. Um, but uh but yeah, it's, it's there i i agree and when when code zeta said this i i think i messaged you and was like holy crap matt how did i, how did I not notice that but yeah this is i mean it's just not it's fear inducing it's nightmare inducing like every one of these things is, is your worst nightmare and um yeah and she she remains kind of blissfully ignorant to all these things and i think we're gonna that's one of the big things i think we're gonna explore in this arc is um we've kind of touched on it earlier but taylor's uh, ability to um, see what she wants to see and ignore what she wants to ignore um, and how that uh, plays into what her actions this arc are. So I think it's yeah. going to be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. User Foxtail Lavender um, is asking if we would consider a follow-up read-through of Twig um, or whether we would rather uh, branch out, as it were. Um, <laughs> we just started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we'll, 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 we we can't possibly know at this point is the actual honest answer. And then the secondary answer is our tentative plan is that um, if Wild Bo has started writing Worm 2 by the time we finish this podcast series, then we might just segue directly into doing week by week podcasts about Worm 2. Um, I but, I hope that works out because I think that would be really cool because I think that you know we have we have a lot of audience interaction as we're seeing right now but if we could be analyzing these things as they come and the people that are listening to this are also listening to them 
at the fr- like reading them the first time like we are, I think that would be really cool. So I'm really yeah. hoping that timing works out. But of course, we have zero control over that. And we also have um, 28 weeks left. So yeah, right. <laughs> at yeah. least, at least. Yeah. We'll see. But, you know, feel free to make these suggestions or we'll continue. We'll uh, continue to consider them, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, user Predictablicious um, points out that in line with what we were saying about Taylor's mean descriptions of people, uh, that Taylor usually describes almost everyone either in a positive or, or a negative way, but rarely neutral. Um, and and they they kind of infer that this is essentially Taylor incorporating the bullying that she's received into her view of the world um, uh, and, and kind of the, the attacks on her appearance. She's almost projecting that kind of mentality on other people. Um, and, yeah. and also, this, the uh, predictable just furthermore points out that in the interludes, the descriptions, meaning the descriptions when they're from people who aren't Taylor, don't seem to be so strongly polarized. Almost as if this is intentional on Wild Bo's behalf, and he's very intentionally setting this up, um, yeah. which is good. It kind of confirms, you know, what we've been saying these past couple of weeks. Um, I, I, this mm-hmm. was a good comment. I really, I really agree with this a lot, and I've been paying a lot of attention to it. I think Taylor also um, does something I'm, I've dubbed description fucking, which is where, <laughs> <laughs> which is where she describes someone in such delicious detail that she definitely wants them. And I'm definitely yeah. going to be calling out uh, when that happens. Yeah. Someone in particular. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, YouTube user Thomas uh, discusses how, uh, so, so I kind of seem, I think I came off as being a, a Mr. Gladly apologist last episode. Um, when he turned away from Taylor when she was being surrounded. And I don't think Thomas is going to let me get away with that here uh, because he he clearly witnessed the bullying. And so it, if he had intervened, it would have just been him intervening and bullying this, that he was witnessing. It wouldn't have been, you know, doing it on Taylor's behalf, you know, because she asked him to. And um, so he really should have stepped in. And I, I think I, I definitely agree with that. Like I, I, I didn't even, when I listened to the podcast later, I was like, man, I, I really didn't mean to sound how, how I came out being like, yeah, but she told him to walk away. So he walked away. So everything's good. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Um, and, and Matthew also on YouTube, like follows up on that. I think it was actually a reply to Thomas's original thing. Um, and I can read that one, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. basically Matthew just says that Taylor and Mr. Gladly have more in common than, uh, than they think they're both declining to use their powers that could generate the authority necessary to stop bullying. Um, but they ch- both choose not to. Um, I like this comment. I don't, I don't fully agree, Matthew, um, because I think Gladly's authority is given to him by his position within the school he's a teacher like he he's given this authority and told he has to use it whereas taylor's is completely independent from the normal chain of authority so i would argue mr gladly has a duty to execute this authority to stop the bullying whereas taylor does not have the authority to make that decision um but it's a good comment nonetheless yeah uh sammy on the website uh it points out kind of a metaphorical connection between Lung's powers and Taylor's bullies. And the idea being that uh, Taylor's afraid that if she fights back against her bullies, they'll just hit her harder and come on harder. Similar to how Lung's powers build his defenses against, against the enemy's attacks. Um, so the, and, and, you know, the only reason Taylor is able to succeed against Lung is because of her future friends who come along. So it's like a, it's a metaphor that, uh, her her friends are what give her the ability to succeed against Lung, kind of like how she kind of needs friends to survive against her bullies, essentially. I, I like that. Yeah, yeah, and I like I like it a lot too. And it's one of those things that I I get the feeling might not have been intentional. Like like and of course we can't we can only guess at the author's intent. But I think it's something that works. Like, you know, a lot of times you have the author in- intentionally sets up things as metaphors and sets up things um, to play off of each other. But sometimes you have things that just align perfectly without that kind of uh, forethought. And this feels like something like that. Like, um, this feels like something that just happened to work out that way. Um, and I think it's really cool. Um, and and Wildbo might not have even been conscious of that he was doing it. But it's a very good point. 
Yeah, I think that's what happens when you weave your themes in so well that you you see them popping up in different places and you Mm -hmm. can draw analogies between things, even if they weren't designed to be that way. It's just the theme expressing itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of themes, uh, user Douglas on the website uh, gave us a really nice list of themes. And uh, I think I mentioned before that I was kind of being paranoid and, and trying not to do something like listing themes because I, I was like, well, then Scott will know what the story is about prematurely. And again, I'm, I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, I think this is a great list of themes and, and we can add to it. But these are some things that I think we should be keeping our eyes on. For example, power versus powerlessness uh, and role reversal. Um, so a lot of characters, including Danny and Taylor, feel really powerful uh, sorry powerless even though they may be the most powerful person in the room in in a given situation um and in this chapter glory girl has power and abuses it and then ends up in a position of weakness um relative to her sister panacea sorry that was last week actually where she ended up in a position of weakness yeah um consequences unintended consequences for example uh, the team decides to add taylor and then rachel reacts extremely negatively which they didn't expect um information i think is a big theme especially if we watch tattletale um the, the uh just information being power here i think is a big is a big lever like emma emma knows things about about taylor's life that she can use to hurt her tattletale obviously knows stuff uh, um taylor has has a secret which is that she's she thinks of herself as infiltrating the undersiders and then finally, uh, the last theme that they listed was purpose, uh, why you do what you do, and how that relates to the, to the other themes. Um, ta- uh, example being uh, Taylor is lonely and doesn't comprehend how much it impacts her, and Glory Girl and Panacea are, are out of control, and that Arms Master wants to take credit for himself. So everyone, essentially, motivation is another way of phrasing that, which is obviously something to pay a lot of attention to when you're talking about characters and, and why the story flows the way it does. Yeah, those are uh, really great. Like, I really loved this comment. Um, it really breaks things down in a very digestible way. And I think we should probably keep a running list. And whenever we find something new, we should add to it. Because um, I'm sure there are a lot of themes at play in this work, especially considering how long it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think we, we should actually have like a, a an actual formal list. So I'll, I'll work on that for next time. Sweet. All right, so let's move into the chapter discussion of agitation, or the arc discussion. So it starts out with Taylor leaving her house to jog to meet Brian. Uh, They have breakfast together, where they discuss, among other things, the brawl with Hellhound the previous day. Uh, Brian explains that the other undersiders are all independent of their parents by various means, and then he gives her a gift, which is the key to the undersider's lair. So it's just kind of another token inviting her into their world. And then she leaves breakfast with him to go to school, but leaves school pretty much immediately when she sees uh, Sophia, who who mocks her. So basically, Taylor's threshold for playing hooky from school is almost zero at this point. <laughs> um, and she even thinks to herself as she's leaving, like, it's going to be even harder for me to come tomorrow because I've missed today and now I have to excuse that. Um, so it's a pretty, she's getting herself into kind of a pickle here. Yeah. Um, so this, I mean, this chapter, it doesn't do a lot, but there are definitely some important things here. Um, you're absolutely right about Taylor. And, um, the, the part of this chapter I love the most is actually that moment where she's going to school and, you know, you're seeing inside her mind as she rationalizes how to get through the school day. Like she's very methodical with it. Like, okay, I just got to get through like first period is going to be easy because X, Y, Z. And then this period is going to be hard, but it's only like 90 minutes long. And there's just something so like wonderfully human about that to me. Um, like, cause I think we've all done that. I think we've all had a day or a week or like, even, even if you're exercising, you're running, like you're running a long distance run and you're breaking it up into little sections and say, if I get past this section, then I have to get to the next one. And it's just, it's just a little small touch that just makes her feel so human. Um, and then of course, all that planning is immediately shattered the second, like she sees someone's talk bad about her and she's just like, nope, done, gone. Yeah. Yeah, especially now that she kind of feels like she doesn't have to deal with this. Speaking of which, how do you feel about her rationalizations surrounding Rachel and and her 
altercation with Rachel. Um, it, it seems like she's going out of her way to make it seem like it doesn't bother her. Um, but it, I mean, it definitely still does. Um, like I, the, the stuff with Rachel is kind of cool because it's basically an exposition dump, right? I mean, they're basically telling us what happened in Rachel's past. And I think, you know, we're, we're going to, my prediction with this is that we're going to see how much more alike these two characters are as we move along. Um, Rachel came from a very troubled background. She had a lot of issues. Um, Taylor has similar issues, um, although not, not quite as extreme. Um, but I, I like, again, how this handled the exposition because, you know, this is stuff that Rachel herself is never going to talk about. Um, she's never going to tell Taylor what her past was like. So having it be two characters talking about her is, is clever. Yeah. Yeah. And and also it serves to characterize Brian and explain kind of who he is and, and that he's kind of empathetic, even though he's a, a apparently violent supervillain. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so Taylor just basically goes back to the hideout from school where Brian is giving Alex some lessons in hand-to-hand combat. Uh, but Alec is just too lazy and, and quits. And so um, uh, he takes over teaching Taylor the hand-to-hand combat. Um, um, and Taylor is not really taking to it very well. And I mean, it's, it's the, essentially this, almost this whole chapter is, um, is just this scene of kind of, uh, almost d- d- domestic uh, interactions in their in their um, in their lair, and uh, getting to know the characters a little bit more, understanding that Alec is kind of a lazy smartass, and Brian is kind of a dedicated, hardworking guy who's kind of been around the block, even though he's young. And Taylor is trying really hard to learn, even though she's you know she doesn't really know what she's doing yet, and maybe in over her head. Um, yeah, and there's also yeah. some uh, some description description fucking here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Taylor yeah. talks about uh, veins running down Brian's biceps and the definition of his chest. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I love these small moments. Like it's so funny seeing how she compares Alec to like physical description and Brian's. I love it. Um, yeah, it's it's consistent and it's always funny to me. Um, yeah. Also, Matt, and- I, I learned in this one that the balls of your feet are not the heels. Um, uh-huh. t- Taylor didn't know this and neither did Scott. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> All through my life, I thought when people said, get on the balls of your feet, they were talking about the yeah. heels. Um, it's, it's, I'm not too make, embarrassed to admit this. <laughs> it's going to make certain things really difficult to do. Uh, <laughs> well, what part of your foot looks like a ball, Matt? What I mean, part? I mean, it looks kind of the, you know, like the knuckle where your big toe inter- inserts into your Look, whatever. I don't know the words for these things. Whatever. I used to. All right. And then the chapter ends with Tattletale walking in saying that uh, there's a new job that their sponsor has sent them, which, of course, perks Taylor's interest because she's trying to gather information on this sponsor. That's why she's here. She's not here because she wants to spend time with handsome Brian and and have camaraderie with these people. She's here to gather information about the sponsor. So... I, I do think there's one lo- quote in here I wanted to point out to you, though. Um, as Brian's kind of talking about the best ways to fight someone, she she says, um, it's a little disquieting to hear Brian uh, methodically describing how to break a human being. I saw him as a nice guy if I ignored his career choice. And it's just like, Taylor, come on. Like, <laughs> like... Uh, She like, again, you know, we've talked about rationalization, we've talked about compartmentalization, and and she's again and again doing it. And I think it's weird, like there was a moment in the last arc that Taylor almost had a moment of realization when she was walking out that she realized um, she wanted these guys approval, she wanted them to like her. Um, And and you think of that as a moment of like sudden realization where she's going to suddenly be aware of this fact that she needs all this stuff, but she, she almost skirts in and out of this realization, um, like from scene to scene. And I originally, when I was thinking about that, I was like, well, is that just bad writing? Is that bad characterization? And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, no, it's just, it's just human. Like we, like there's not a time in a person's life when we suddenly realize all things and then um, forever go forward knowing that we've had this profound realization of our character. We forget 
we avoid, we push it out of the way, we don't want to deal with it, and then we get ourselves in, in similar situations that we just realized were bad situations. And I think that's what's happening here. Yeah, I'm, somewhere in this chapter, it shows how good she is at sort of not thinking about things where her dad brings up like this big incident that happened with with the bullies. And Taylor, once again, just kind of like shuts down and, and won't even think about it. Like it, it, we we don't even even get to see it inside her head because she's so mm-hmm. she's so locked down about that. Um, and if and, and if we're going yeah. back to the theme, like the, the major the major theme of this story is bullying, then I think we're seeing psychologically the effects of what that does to a person, right? Like you, yeah. you have to compartmentalize, you have to push these things away just to survive. And it's getting her in trouble. I mean, we're definitely going to see that she's, she's going down a road. And I know there, there you know, going forward, there's going to be a lot of gray lines between what is a villain and what is a hero. But right now she's, she's going down a bad path. Um, we're yeah. about to, we're about to talk about a bank robbery. So, um, this is, this is, this is the result. This is what bullying does to a person. Right. Just from a purely operant conditioning, like perspective at school is nothing but sticks. And with the undersiders is nothing but carrots. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's no mystery at all that she's being pushed in this direction. Even if she's even, even if she doesn't like endorse that decision on a, on a high level, it's like, well, you're, you're an animal. You're going to be, you're going to be pushed the way the world pushes you. Very well put. So the next chapter, chapter three, the undersiders discuss the proposed bank robbery, which their sponsor has, um, has put forward. So of course the sponsor is basically saying, you know, do this or don't do it. Uh, but there's, you know, there's money in it for you. And, um, it's, it's kind of the same deal they always have, except this time it's a little bit more favorable for them. So at first, Brian argues pragmatically that the risk reward ratio for a bank robbery doesn't make sense. And that in the past, they've only really managed to win fights against other parahumans because they pick their battles carefully. Whereas in a bank robbery, you're in a more vulnerable situation where you kind of have to fight whoever comes in. And Alec and Rachel take the position that the bank robbery would be good for their rep, uh, which they both care about. Uh, and then they also want the money because they're uh, greedy children. Yeah. Um, and so Tattletale then counters that the location chosen is the biggest bank in the, in the city and that it's close to Arcadia High, which is where all the wards go to school. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about like this concept yet of of how the how the um, protectorate and the parahuman organization works, where the wards are basically like the teenage superheroes who get their powers whenever they get them, but the good guys want to kind of fold them into their ranks. So they let them be practicing superheroes, almost like trainee superheroes. So they keep going to school and they maintain their secret, secret identities, but they, um, they get pulled out of school when they need to go do some superheroing. Um, so anyway, that, that aside being said, <laughs> um, um, Tattletale says like the, the fact that this is the situation should mean that like maybe one or two or three of the less powerful wards will show up and it'll be a quick and easy fight and then the sponsor agrees to match them two for one on the cash with a minimum payout of 25 grand plus costs basically it's just a really good deal there's there's no downside guys it's going to go really well um, <laughs> red flag red flag yeah yeah and 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 when when asked why he's doing this Tattletail is just like, I don't know, maybe it's because he doesn't want to fund a team of nobodies, which I don't know. Do you buy that Scott? Not for a second. As, as um, the reason for why this is no, being. No, with, with, I mean, no. for a couple of reasons, first of all, I think Tattletail's power is so cool and it's so powerful that like, first of all, you don't know when she's using it. So literally the, the method of convincing Brian to do this whole thing might have been her using her power unknown. Like we don't know. Second mm-hmm. of all, when you establish yourself as the person who knows things, then when you say things, people tend to believe you, um, even if you're just bullshitting. Um, yeah. And and I, I think we're seeing a lot of that here. Like the thing that I found most interesting about this is um, obviously if someone's willing to give you a crap ton of money for stealing money, something weird is going on. Um, the fact that it wasn't the, bo- the mystery boss that came up with the idea of doing a bank robbery. That was tattletale herself. All that the boss cared about was we want you to do a particular job 
at this particular time. It doesn't matter what the job is, just do a job at this time, which obviously is, to me, is you exist to be a diversion for something bigger that's going on, um, and we're willing to pay you for it. So, yeah, no, this is this is total bullshit um, that anyone in this room, like, listens to this and doesn't say, no, this is a bad idea, is kind of crazy. Um, I don't yeah, know. I'm, yeah, I mean... I guess their their reasoning is like it's you know it's worked out for us before to to do this guy's missions so so we might as well um yeah i mean the only there, there's there's two rational people in the room um there's Brian and there's Taylor um yeah. and Brian uh, is going to be convinced and i mean Taylor like part of me understands that she's in a position to where like if she's going to go forward with her quote unquote plan, she can't say no, but there's also a little bit of that. I want these people to like me ness to it. Um, so she, she feels trapped and she's smart enough to realize that something's not right with this, but not enough to not do anything about it. Yeah. And she's not going to come out arguing strongly against, no. against, uh, against anything really. Yeah. And it, it does. It, it does timid here. Yeah, it does go back to show that they are, you know, children. Um, again, mm-hmm. like there's there's a tendency to forget this, especially in the latter half of this arc when these people are using their badass powers to do badass things. Um, we might forget that they're just kids. Yeah, um, and, right. And they are really good at what they do, but that's like as children, that's a that's a scale, you know. Right. Yeah. It, it's 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 easy to forget with Alec that a lot of his characterization is just the fact that he's 15 basically. So he's like a lot of his yeah, surliness right. is just like, well, he's literally, he's like, he, he's the youngest of them and he's um, super disinterested and detached a lot of the time. And a lot of that is who he is, but a lot of it is also just, I think his age. So then uh, they move on to discuss the powers of the heroes that they're likely to be facing, which I'm going to go into in a, moderate amount of detail now because we're going to have to know that soon anyway so we might as well know that now sure so so first there's aegis uh, who flies and has very high durability due to having massive redundancies and reinforcements in his body Uh, and he has functionally speaking he has super strength because he can run on adrenaline all day it's not that his muscles are stronger it's just that he can use adrenaline sort of constantly um and I, i i get the sense from this from these descriptions by the way that we only know this detail about how his super strength works because of Tattletail's power do you, do you feel like that's true Scott Yeah I agree I think we keep learning more and more just how uh, powerful this girl actually is um because information is so important as one of uh, the themes that Douglas talked about earlier were um having information and not having information and the fact that she has this is incredibly powerful and we'll definitely see that going forward yeah, right. Next, we have my favorite superhero name in the entire series. And I was just waiting for Scott to get here so that we could <laughs> talk about it. Clock Blocker. Oh my God, um, what a name. That's so amazing. Yes, I this, this by itself, it could just sell someone on Reading Worm just based on this name. <laughs> um, and his powers, he can freeze objects or people in time. Uh, so if he touches you or if he touches an object, then you freeze in time for somewhere between 30 seconds and 10 minutes, something like that. And he can use it defensively or offensively to either, you know, free someone in place to stop them or to create an impenetrable shield out of a bed sheet or whatever. Vista, another one of the wards, she warps space so she can squeeze space so she can, for example, hop across the street in one hop or lengthen it to increase the distance between herself and an opponent. Uh, but she's limited by the Manton effect, which, Scott, do you want to go into the Manton effect a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, this is really cool to me. So my understanding of it is that some powers don't work on living people unless the power itself is specifically designed to work on living things, right? Um, yeah, I, I would phrase it as most powers always, uh, almost always either work on only living things or only non-living things. Very few work on living and, and, and non-living things. Yeah, so this is, I think this is a very cool way of um, avoiding writing yourself into a corner. And I think it shows a lot of foresight on Wildbow's part that he writes this thing in. Because, I mean, whenever you're talking superheroes with all these superpowers, you're going to get to a point where um, 
it's just like, well, why can't X person just do this and win everything? Um, right. And it's it's a clever in-world way of solving that problem. And it also la- adds a little mystery to it's a little hint as toward the origin of these powers. Like we've gotten a little hint from the sky on thing. Now we've got this, there's this weird effect. There are laws and rules to these powers um, outside of um, just that they exist. I think it's cool little touches. It's very clever. Yeah. It makes you wonder why this is. And, and then it of course makes you wonder why there are some capes that aren't limited by the Manton effect. Cause they mention a couple of names like not they, they mentioned the name narwhal and they're like yes yeah, so the, some of the strongest capes aren't limited in this way and it's yeah it's very uh i'm sure we'll i'm sure we'll see more of this <laughs> hint, <laughs> hint, hint. Hint, hint, hint. We may hear this term again so next we have a uh, kid win who is a tinker which um i think i don't know if this is the first time we really talk about what a tinker is because arms master is also a tinker um, but they, they go into more description of the fact that his power is essentially just that he builds amazing technology. Um, like he has a flying skateboard and laser pistols and a high tech visor and whatever else he may have built since they last saw him because he's always building things. So Scott, what are your feelings about this tinker power designation? Well, the question I had for you, and I mean, I think you can tell me this without spoiling anything. I'm not clear, like, is, is tinker itself a superpower is it literally mean your brain is like super powerful or super good or or are these people just like the batmans of the parahumans universe like they're just very good at at having gadgets and fighting crime it's definitely more than just being the batmans um they're they they use so uh, this is probably considered a mild spoiler but um i'm not too worried about this because you asked um basically <laughs> that the, they have like a specialization where they can just make technology that no one can make nor even understand um so so like conceivably there are no other f- hoverboards in the world except for the hoverboard that kidwin made and if you ask kidwin to explain how he made it he probably couldn't even explain it to you because he just sort of understands it Huh. Okay. Um, That's cool. So yeah. So it's and and, and also, Kidwin wouldn't necessarily be able to pass an advanced calculus test on top of that. Like, so it's not just super smart. It's a very specific focused. I understand. I speak tech, and I right. understand this how to build machines. Yeah. That's cool. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I think this is one of the coolest ones because it allows things of the class of like iron man to exist in in the worm universe but there's an explanation other than just like oh yeah this one guy happens to be smarter and more productive than lockheed martin in its entirety (laughs) um so yeah anyway next hero gallant pretends he's a tinker because he wears an armored suit but actually he shoots energy blasts that are accompanied by surges of various emotions and he and uh yeah that's that's uh that's gallant any thoughts about gallant um well they also mentioned that he's glory girl's boyfriend right um yeah and i just thought this was cool because you know we were talking about the purpose of these interludes and how they introduce characters to us and i think this is a comment that has a lot of history behind it because we've just recently finished reading a whole chapter where we watch glory girl in acts in action. So when gallant, when they say gallant is boyfriend of glory girl, we have emotional connection to that. We have context. Um, we know what it means. And I think that's just a cool way of showing how he's structuring this thing to where these payoffs land and give us the context we need. I think just, just cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I also noticed that Lori Girl seems a lot more powerful than any of the heroes that were just described, uh, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And then finally, they talk about Shadow Stalker, whose power is that she phases into a ghostly state where she can glide and pass through things, and she shoots a crossbow, um, which uh, and and she has some history with the Undersiders too, um, some uh, some some hints at a some conflict in the past with them. So ultimately, Taylor decides to participate in this in this robbery um, for her reasoning that she needs to get in good with them so she can find out more about their mysterious benefactor. So, okay. So at this point, (laughs) 
Taylor's been in the Undersiders for a day. Think, yeah. Maybe like maybe 24 hours. Yeah. Um, and she's already agreeing to participate in these crimes. Um, she, she listens, like they plan it after three hours and she's like, yep, I'm doing this. Um, she's, she's still really trying to rationalize it by saying she's involved because it would a blow her cover and by B being involved that, uh, she can make sure that nobody gets hurt because she's there. She can stop people from getting hurt. Um, frankly, Matt, this is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, yeah. she's in over her head. Um, she, she's, be, she's making decisions rashly. She's on her own. She has no one to turn to if any of this goes wrong. It's just a bad, bad idea. Um, and you know, we're, we don't even really see the full consequences of this bad idea in this arc, but I mean, the, the, the stepping stones are being laid. Um, yeah. it's not looking good. Yeah. I think someone actually tells her almost exactly these things <laughs> in the next chapter. Spoilers. Uh, oh, which, yeah, which, oh, incidentally, um, before, before she leaves the Undersiders, they watch the pirated Earth Aleph version of the Star Wars prequels, which is hilarious because the Star Wars prequels are bad in every universe, obviously. Yeah. And also introduces the idea that there's something called Earth Aleph, which is, the which f- is what? <laughs> it's so casually brought up. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I had to reread it when I first looked like first I thought they were just watching a TV show in which there was an alternate earth that people were sending media through a hole. And I was like, no, wait, she's talking about the real world. This is actually happening. And it's just so hilariously casual um, that I just I I I loved it. Um, And Professor Haywire, the guy who opened the 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 breach between the two worlds, it's just a perfect name. Um, These are little details that I mean, they might come up again. I don't know. But even if even if this never came up again in the story i'd still just love it as just a world building detail um Mm -hmm. it just it's just really fun yeah yeah it it, it is kind of a trope from other superhero properties where there's always dc has like seven thousand different planets i'm watching the flash right now and there's like at least an earth one two three and nine um okay the thing the most thing i find interesting about the the earth designations in those shows is um how does who gets to decide who earth one is like it's like it's the the main one for our characters but like all the other earths are really okay with being called earth 17 which is right. weird well that's what's funny to me here is that the they're watching the prequel from earth aleph where aleph is basically a in the hebrew alphabet so whatever earth they're on it's not earth a yeah um, probably earth q or something yeah well Okay, so this this chapter starts out jumping around a bit because we're we're spending a lot of time in Taylor's head, um, and a lot of it is just kind of her justifications to herself and talking to her dad uh, about the about the undersiders basically. But she's lying, she or or giving half truths. Um, you know, she gives some vague, semi-true details about them because she had already told her dad that she's spending time with these new friends. So like she tells them her, she tells him their real names, but, and and tells him that she's not getting along with Rachel. And, um, he's, he's trying to, he's like trying really hard to be there for her. But of course, as usual, she kind of shuts down when he asks about the bullies and, and she down and not only that, but she downplays the the bullying that is happening, uh, that, that has been happening recently. Matt, I I love this part. I love this part so much. Like we're we're about to spend the the next twenty minutes, twenty thirty minutes talking about huge superhero fights and like like all the cool things and all the logical ways that these fights were constructed and how clever it was. But this right here um, is my favorite moment in in this arc. Um, just these two people sitting down, like trying desperately to connect with each other, and they just they just can't. And Mm -hmm. like Taylor's reaction, like Taylor again is skirting in and out of awareness of herself. Like she's happy when her dad doesn't push her, but she's so desperate for him to know what's going on. She still feels like she has to give him information. Mm -hmm. Um, So like she still has to tell him a little bit. Um, and, And he, I mean, he genuinely cares, but like this, this relationship, it just seems like it's just broken beyond repair. 
like that moment when she leaves at the end of the chapter and he just like like quietly whispers thank you like it's just even that even that small moment of interaction like was enough for him to say thank you um it is just it's just like it's heartbreaking and yeah. you know th- there's another world where maybe these two people could have had like a real normal relationship but you just really believe in this moment that this might be irreparable like it, you they might not be able to get past this and that's god it's a bummer yeah, especially with her kind of piling on um, the reasons that they would be driven apart. Right, right. Because, I mean, she's like, she cannot rely on him. She cannot be honest with him. And it's not even just about, like, it's one thing to say, like, superheroes have hidden identities, right? Um, they always do. Like, it's one thing to say that part of her lies to her father is who she is as a parahuman, as a cape. But she can't even be fully honest with her, with him regarding the mundane parts of her life. Um, the the tailor parts the the thing she's going through with as just a human being not the thing she's going through as a bug controlling god person um, right. so it's just it's just so sad and it's just so well done like it's it it's just like conversation back and forth the pacing's really good it's just a very well written scene yeah no I, this is one of my yeah I, I i think i can say that this is my favorite kind of scene that wild Bo writes like today I just kind of had the impulse to read some other chapter for much later in the story. And I won't say anything about what it's about <laughs> other than to say, like, it was just a conversation. Like I just wanted to reread this conversation again. Um, it was not a superhero battle. Sometimes I reread superhero battles. Those are fun, but I totally just go reread the conversations because they're that, they're that good and they make you feel things. And I mean, that's why, that's why we read is to feel things. Right. And and once again, the superhero part of this whole thing is a backdrop to tell character stories. And this is pure character in this moment. And yeah. it's great. Yeah. So I, I neglected to mention at the start of this chapter that she had been quietly talking to someone on her phone and hurriedly hung up. And you kind of assume that she's talking to Brian or one of the undersiders because that's who we just left off with. Um, but we realize as she heads out and dons her costume that she's going to meet arms master. Matt, I don't like this. Yeah. So this is, this is a gripe with me and, okay. and I'm, I'm probably going to make some of our listeners angry and maybe even you angry, but I don't like when stories do like the, the gotcha thing for a surprise reveal, like just for the narrative shock moments. Um, I don't like when they intentionally like, Taylor's on the phone with someone we're in her head, but the story intentionally masks who she was talking to just for the point of us having this, oh, huh, that wasn't who I expected moment. I just don't think it's necessary. Um, and I, I just don't like it. Okay. It, it, yeah, feels, so- it feels lostian to me, like, <laughs> which I know is going to drive you crazy. You're, you're turning me against it. <laughs> um, but it's like, you know, in Lost, like, all these characters know all this information, but they just won't ever, like, tell each other it because then we, the audience, would know and they want to keep it from us for some stupid reason. Like, that's what this, this moment kind of felt like to me. And I, I just didn't like it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to challenge you here, but there's definitely going to be. You know, as is already clear, there are like long term mysteries that are that have been dropped hints at. And this is somewhere on the continuum of being a mystery, I guess, uh, other than the fact that this was obvious misdirection. I mean, the, the other mysteries, I think, involve misdirection, too, because an author has to drop red herrings or you'll just figure out. The solutions of the mysteries too quickly so well, yeah, and, and, I, I hope you enjoy the the reveals of the big you know the the big reveals and, and the big twists later and and that you you find that to be different than this at least and i think as long as it has some sort of narrative function like that, that there was a reason why this information was withheld until this moment i think i will um it's just something like this and i know this is really this is me quibbling and again i think people are going to get annoyed but um there's no there's no narr- narrative function for doing it this way, except for a like a gasp moment at the end of the section, um, and and that just that just rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, we've talked before about how the one of the features of this particular medium is that it has it almost has to have this um, cliffhanger structure. Um, so f- fair enough, I will I will take that as a 
as a comment on the <laughs> on the structure. You're itching so hard to yell at me because I just compared it to Lost. It's really uh, funny. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I'll I'll sleep on it, Scott. I, I almost I almost honestly just think if they had just taken out the part where she's on the phone with someone at the beginning of the chapter, um, I wouldn't have a problem with this. And we just leave like that. We she just leaves the house and she's putting on her costume and we don't know what she's doing. Um, but then suddenly arms master is there. I think it would work better that way. Cause it would be less of intentionally manipulating you, um, for no other reason than to, to drive a shock. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's move well, on. Note for the record. You just alienated the entire audience. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well we had a good run. <laughs> um, okay. So she goes to the arms master. So Arms Master is much less nice today. She asks him for protection and insurance that she won't be treated as a criminal for working undercover as a criminal. Uh, but this time, he's having none of it. There's a lot of tense back and forth, and ultimately we realize that Arms Master is angry at her because of the damage that she did to Lung and almost killing him, which he was blamed and disciplined for. Um, and Arms Master basically says he won't do anything to protect her because she's in way over her head and is pretty dismissive and insulting toward her. And uh, offhandedly mentions that two of the undersiders are murderers, which she didn't know and she finds a little bit shocking. And then at the end, he rudely dismisses her and she leaves and thinks to herself the next time she'll go to Miss Militia, not Arms Master. So basically, she went from generally positive feelings about Arms Master to fairly strongly negative ones and and feeling alienated from the good guys hey as much as i didn't like the reveal of this guy um i love this entire chapter it's really good um there's two things i wanted to focus on here first of all like we we call taylor a child a lot um taylor's a badass like she is intellectually uh, wrestling with this guy um because she knows she can only say certain things because she's worried worried about uh, what she will say if that will tip off Tattletale with her power and she doesn't fully understand it yet. I mean, this guy's like full-grown superhero, um, very experienced guy, and she is intellectually fighting with her, with him. Um, but Taylor's really stupid, too, because Armsmaster is, like, so completely right here. Like, and maybe that's just me as an adult talking and, like, teenage Scott would have been like, yeah, Taylor, she can do it. Why don't you believe in her? Um, but this idea of hers is dumb. It's so stupid. <laughs> and like, he's exactly right. When you are undercover, you have a handler. You have someone that can pull you out if things get too hairy. You have someone you can report to. Like, it, she's by herself. And the, like, she reaches out to him almost like to me, like, to prove that she's still going undercover. Um, it, it's It's all very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um the uh it it it's also interesting that he has this lie detector that allows him to essentially just see right through her and it, I I think sometimes it even shows her things about herself that she doesn't know. Yeah, well, I think the the interesting line right was um when she says something and hit, hit, uh, like he says something and then she responds and then it's like, well, you use your lie detector. Um, that tells you I'm telling the truth. Right. And his response is like, it tells me that you think you're right. Um, and, and she has a very, a very noticeable reaction to that line. Right. Because mm -hmm. again, that's pushing in on, on her self-awareness. That's, that's threatening to uncover the truth behind, um, actually everything that's going on with her that, um, that she is not just doing this because she wants to be an undercover spy and wants to help the heroes by bringing down the bad guys, that she's doing this for another meaning. And any attempt at like bursting that bubble has a very, a very resound effect on her, on her psyche. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really cool way of doing it. Like, cause it lie detectors, absolutely. If you are convinced that what you are saying is the truth, a lie detector will tell you that you are telling the truth. So um, it, it's the, he's not able to actually read what she's thinking. Um, it's just that she believes what she's thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me for some reason of, of earlier um, when she, she thinks about the fact that they only spend like three hours or something planning the bank robbery and like 
how how long would it, would a team of experienced bank robbers need to plan a bank robbery? You know, like <laughs> right. like we you see movies about it where it takes the, you know takes them like six months or, or something, and and it's like these super villain kids literally spend um a, a couple you know a couple hours doing it. Yeah, um, well, and it's so funny because I think she specifically says, "Well, this isn't a heist; it's a bank robbery." And I'm like, "Because were they like? We, well, we looked at the." We looked at the the ducks and we looked at the alarm system, but we said we're not going to mess with that because this is a bank robbery, not a heist. And I'm like, what? What's what's the real <laughs> difference between those? Because it sounds like what you mean is this isn't a well planned, executed bank robbery. This is just a shit show where we're going to bust in, take some money, and leave. Um, and um, spoilers, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. I think I think the the icing on the cake of this moment though to finish up this chapter is that her response to being pushed back against from Arms Master is not to um take into consideration anything that the man is actually saying to her. Her reaction is, well next time I'm going to go to a different person because this person's not giving what me want, what I want. It's literally like I asked mom and mom said no, so I'm going to go to dad. Like that's literally what she's doing. And like it shows again, like her inability to see through the problems of what she's attempting to do right now. Yeah, right. It's a very emotional reaction, and, and yeah, and she doesn't really consider what he's saying. At any I mean, point. and I think in that moment she's like, "Fine, I'm going to rob the shit out of this bank." It's like she like steals her resolve in a moment of anger at a person who basically told her, "Look, what you're doing is not good, and you're going to get in trouble. And here's my advice: do this, this, and this." and no, I'm not doing that. In fact, I'm going to rob the bank. I'm going to catch the bad guy just to show you wrong. So, like, that's you're in a you're in a really great place to make a decision. Good job. Yeah, right. So the next chapter starts out with um, Lisa and Taylor talking about the cops and robbers dynamic of the capes and villains uh, in in the world, essentially. And it's, I, I actually really love this, and Scott, you can tell me what you think, but basically it's the in-universe explanation for why grown men and women with superhuman abilities are running around in costumes and having non-lethal battles. Um, so basically, Title Tales says, most people are just getting thrills and blowing off steam, playing full contact cops and robbers, and sort of acting as a proxy city sports team. Um, and putting a good face on law enforcement, their media darlings, they allow merchandising for the city. And overall, the superhero, supervillain combat doesn't do too much damage. Um, and furthermore, this is kind of as a corollary why some people go straight to the birdcage, but not others. It's because there's an understanding that most villains don't really doing much harm, aren't really doing much harm. Um, and in fact, provide a nice photogenic foil for the superheroes, at least compared to the real psychos. So, yeah, what do you feel about the about the cops and robbers dynamic as as Lisa sketches it out? I mean, it's certainly an extremely pessimistic way to look at this whole thing. Um, it is depressing, and that that the powers that be, the authority, would. Um, intentionally allow this cycle to go on. Um, I'm not sure if I completely buy it. Um, I, I'm kind of bummed that we don't get to see Taylor's opinion on it because Taylor specifically mentions she wanted to give her opinion, um, but she couldn't because she was worried that that would reveal to Lisa um, too much about herself. But we, we can clearly see that Taylor has opinions that differ on this, and I wish we could have seen her point. Um, but I think most importantly to me um, it, it's, it's a very handy way of completely rationalizing bad behavior um, in that, look, we're just perpetuate, perpetuating a cycle that um, the, the authority lets us do. Like, like, we're not really doing that much, that bad stuff. We're, the, the money we're stealing is insured. It's not really that big of a deal. No one's getting hurt. And it's just a way to, uh, it's an excuse to behave however the hell you want to. Um, and that's bad. <laughs> let me let me yeah. just make let me just make that clear. That's that's a not a good rational, rationalization to do illegal, wrong, immoral things. Yeah, I think Taylor does say something along the lines of that sounds very convenient. Um, I don't remember what exactly her words are, 
but it's something like that because it's, she she recognizes that this is kind of a rationalization, and I think even even Lisa recognizes that it's a rationalization, but doesn't really care because she's more of the camp that uh, you know she's just saying, hey, it's it's all it's all in good fun. Hardly anybody gets really terribly hurt. Um, yeah, there's there's a, there are a few things brought up in context of like the real psychos. Um, as distinct from just the run-of-the-mill supervillain supervillains, the way they see themselves to be. Uh, for example, the Endbringers and the Slaughterhouse Nine. I wonder who those guys are, and if we'll hear about them again. <laughs> hint, hint. Um, hint, hint. The thing I love about the Endbringers, and I'm I'm definitely assuming that these will be um, brought up again and again and again, um, is how like physical and immediate a reaction um, Lisa has to just the bringing up of them. I just think that's a really cool touch. Um, It it doesn't get focused on, like, she explains it away by saying she got in a fight with someone, um, so she's in a bad mood, so she's bringing up this terrible negative thing. But, like, it's it's a really good way of cementing in your reader, these guys are the worst of the worst, because look how a bad guy, a person who's literally about to rob a bank, reacts to even mentioning their name. Um, And I think that's really cool. That's a really smart little touch. Yeah, she basically says that Taylor's being morbid just for bringing it up. Right, so it right. Tells you the order of, of things. So then, uh, after this conversation where they justify their behavior to each other, they hop out of the scrubbed vans and head into the back of the bank. Um, so this is the part where things become very actiony um, for 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 a prolonged period of time, which is going to require a bit of a different summarization technique relative to the other parts, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I think so just used- that we're going to go through this pretty fast because while this is a large section of the uh, the arc, it is mostly action beats and there's not a lot to dive into. Right, right. And and it's not really that entertaining to listen to someone just go like, and then this guy did this, and then this guy did that. <laughs> right, and then he dodged, right. yeah. So they use a combination of Gru's Darkness, Tattletale's knowledge of the layout and where the people are located and Regent's ability to quickly incapacitate, plus Taylor's bugs, to quickly swoop in through the building and neuter all opposition and take everyone hostage before anyone can really react. Tattletail gets through all the keypad locked doors easily, and Hellhound dogs are have been growing this whole time, and now they're enormous and terrifying. And by the time they burst into the lobby, there's a cloud of darkness and terrifying bugs and demonic dogs. So everyone surrenders pretty quickly. This really and goes back to this uh, nightmare idea that was talked about earlier, how these guys powers are the embodiment of fear um, as they yeah. bust into this bank. Right. Yeah. Somehow, somehow I didn't, didn't grasp this the first time through, but it's, uh, it's definitely pretty bad. And then of course, once they do this, uh, Taylor like sees the terror on everyone's face and, it's like for some reason only now that it sinks in to her that she's <laughs> going to be psychologically harming people by doing this to them and thinks to herself, I was going to hell for this. Well, and it's crazy because it was her plan. Like she decided that the best way to ensure that the hostages aren't going to get hurt is for me to be the one responsible for them. And the way I'm going to be responsible for them is I'm going to put a bunch of black widows on them and tell them if they move, they're going to die. And yet it only occurs to her after she says this, that this is going to freak the shit out of people. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. It's also kind of scary how good she was at that speech. Um, yeah. Like that's kind of, it, it was kind of horrifying. Like, like yeah. she's, she's really good at this. Yeah. It's an excellent supervillain speech that she gives <laughs> off the cuff and everyone is, is absolutely terrified. I think she systematically underestimates how terrifying her power is because um, she's used to it, I guess, and she's yeah. Well, I mean, she she looks at bugs um, the way she's looked at, right? We we talked about mm-hmm. that last week, where she sees these as non scary little insignificant things, just like she kind of sees herself. So there's no way people would be afraid of her um, because she's just Taylor. Um, and then she's constantly reminded that no, she is definitely more than that. Yeah, maybe one thing to start thinking about now, which is something that I think you're being prompted to think about constantly but but you're never really the 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 narrative voice never really tells you to think about it until much later but i i see no reason not to point it out now is that just to think about what the environment around taylor must be like because she's always talking about 
putting bugs on people to track where they are and and being able to sense everything in the location with bugs and it's like other people are going to notice that there's bugs everywhere <laughs> all the time whenever right. she's around because yeah they've already established that she uses the bug to sense location by just having the bugs climb all over their bodies. Um, and that's yeah. like, that's how she knows their location. So it's just, I sent the bugs and they flew on the person's face. I mean, people notice when bugs crawl on their faces. Right. That's absolutely right. And I'll, I'll definitely pay attention to that. And we also know that she unconsciously, she does things like unconsciously gather all the bugs in the area up into a giant swarm when she's, you know, <laughs> yeah. agitated or whatever. So it's yeah. like, yeah. And yeah. Um, so having having taken the hostages, they've been bagging the money in the vault, which of course Tattletail can get into. They're bagging it, they're loading it onto the giant dogs and talking. And Taylor makes the mistake of trying to make small talk with Hellhound. That doesn't go well because she just kind of almost starts a fight and they're they're separated again. And then of course Tons of wards arrive, way more than they were expecting. We have Vista, Clock Blocker, Aegis, Kidwin. And one they didn't even prepare for, Browbeat, who's described as a point-blank telekinetic that can heal or bulk up at will. And and uh, Tattletail also says that there's someone else unidentified on the roof. So this is like more than twice as many people as they were expecting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they discuss escape options. And Scott, who who is it that suggests that instead of trying to escape, they just attack head on? Well, it's certainly got to be a hellhound, right? Uh, I mean, you would assume so based on knowing what you know about her character, but <laughs> but oh, is it uh, is it the good guy masquerading as a bad guy that does it? Yeah, it's the good. Huh. It's Taylor who huh. recommends that they attack the hero superheroes headfirst. I am so surprised that that happened. Yeah. No, th- I mean, this is like it, it. It's funny that it both seems out of character, but also completely in character for her, um, because we've seen her over and over again act first, think later. Um, and, and it's kind of, again, it's, it's unsettling for me as this person rooting for this poor damaged girl to see just, just how easily she's slipping into this lifestyle, um, and, and to, to this activity. Yeah. Um, so, so attack they do, um, they, they basically, first glue uh, grew <laughs> glue grew floods the street with darkness and they send some hostages out into the darkness so that the heroes realize that they shouldn't just attack and then tattletail figures out that clock blocker and aegis have switched costumes and so when they send hellhound out to attack they attack the guy in the clock blocker costume instead of the the aegis costume while taylor starts attacking or rather probing at first clock blocker with her bugs um so it's th- this is essentially the onset of superhero combat in earnest and it get, and it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly um yeah but yeah. so uh, the thing i wanted to point out here is just how cool and key uh tattletail is to this entire battle like everything that's going to happen from now on is her in her element um like you talked about, I think, at, I think it was the very first episode, how, you know, fights in this thing are very rationally constructed. And it's almost as if people are like playing a game of superhero chess with each other, where they're um, coming up with techniques and strategies on how to use their powers to overcome the bad guy's powers. And having a person like Tattletail on your team who can just completely sniff out your strategy is amazing. And it's so powerful. And like, you know, we, we've seen hints as to why this group has just never been caught before. And this is it. I mean, this is it in action. Like these two people had this really clever idea. Let's switch costumes. They'll go try to fight you hand to hand and then we'll be stopped because you can stop time. I mean, that's really smart. And it's like, sorry, no, you can't do it. You lose. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they did a pretty clever one up, actually. And then, of course, yeah. Tattletail does an even clever one up because she has that power. Yeah. I mean, and on top of that, like. We talked about how Gru's darkness seems weak, and then it's like, well, okay, so demonic dogs also seem like they wouldn't be so great if you could just shoot them down at range or something like that. But if you have <laughs> de- demonic dogs attacking outside of a, uh, I mean, attacking from within a cloud of completely impenetrable darkness that just kind of moves wherever on the battlefield it needs to be for maximum tactical advantage, then uh, you see that there's pretty synergistic combos of powers that start to stack up. 
Yeah, and I mean, as a guy who loves movies so much, I'm I'm imagining this whole battle shot as a film, and it is just like chaos. It's absolute <laughs> chaos, and that's it's really cool to imagine. Yeah, yeah. So Taylor starts getting a bad headache at, at about this point. She doesn't understand why at this point. Um, she's kind of watching everything, but she's also what she can't see from the darkness. She's keeping tabs on it because her bugs are on various people. And so she's tracking them, moving through the darkness. She can even tell who's who uh, by various cues that her bugs are giving her. Uh, so as she's attacking clock blocker, he starts using his power on some of the bugs, but quickly realizes that he'll just make a cage around himself if he freezes all the bugs that are touching him. So he tries a few different tricks to avoid them. Finally tries to ignore them at which point Taylor causes them to bite him all over and then try to crawl into his mouth and nose and under his eyelids. Um, speaking of nightmarish applications of her power. Oh my God. <laughs> which, yeah, at this point I feel more sorry for, um, for this guy almost than I do for long because he's, I mean, what's funny in this case is they, they don't even know that she's here or who she is or what her power is. He, right. He's just like suddenly bugs are attacking me and trying to crawl into my eyes for no reason. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, literally what happens is, is bugs crawl inside his body and then he gets so freaked out. He freezes them. So now he's literally just stuck in place with frozen bugs in his body. And the only nice thing she does is once she realizes that he's done that, she pulls the other bugs out. Um, that's very nice. So it's only the frozen bugs that are stuck inside <laughs> your body and, and not the moving bugs. Um, but Jesus, this is awful. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's scarily effective too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he does have a really, really good power, but hers is one that sort of seems to just trump it fairly fairly straightforward yeah yeah so that chapter we we see some some use of vista using her power to support the other fighters um but then uh the chapter ends we skip to the next chapter gallant shoots hellhound with an emotion blast which which who knows what he was intending but it causes her to go completely berserk and become a lot more violent there's there's a bunch more complicated fighting outside powers playing off each other. Interesting stuff happening. Can't go into full detail here because it's, this it gets to be so much. Um, kid win teleports in some kind of massive particle cannon and starts shooting the dogs. And at this point when the, you know, the tide is kind of going back and forth. I, that's one thing I like, I will comment that I really love about the way these battles go is it's always really clear which way the, the ebb and flow of the battle is going, you know, it's like, Oh th yeah, that happened. Go undersiders. Oh no. Oh no. The dogs are, are being, are being damaged. And then, you know, yeah. it's, you're, you're very, you're never just like, and then this happened and then, and then this happened. It's more like a very clear, um, push and pull and, and drama of what's happening. You always understand what the, what the stakes are and, and, and where the battle is. Absolutely. There, there's cause and effect and there's segments like the battle moves from this area to this area um it, it's 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 segmented it's layered it builds upon itself it's just very well paced it's very well executed um this is really good i mean this is really good stuff and we're not going to go into the detail at all um but i'll just say that i hate the name kid win and i kind of <laughs> i'm kind of glad that he's pretty useless in this fight and gets his ass kicked because i do not like that name at all yeah i mean i think the name is almost maybe chosen to give a certain sense of him as, as, yeah, I as think like so. a poserish kind of kind of guy who just wants to be cool. I don't know. Maybe, maybe unfair. I don't know. What's up? I'm kid win and I'm here to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny because while he's brings in this massive particle Ganon and it looks like the tide is turning in favor of the heroes. Regent finally steps in having just been not present for the whole battle. And very quickly takes out, I think, is it more than two heroes? Like very, very, very rapidly with just with like simple incapacitating, like, oh, now you're not holding that anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your he, hand spasm. he makes Aegis like fall out of the sky. Yeah, um, he for makes, sure. It, I mean, he does yeah. it like with a bunch of people. Yeah, he, he, take, he basically takes away Kid Wynn's equipment just by causing him to like fall down and his hand spasm. And then he tasers him. Um on the like <laughs> casually tasers him on the ground um which once again we we were making fun of regent's power for being weak and now he's owning everyone yeah i mean especially like i think the, the thing 
the thing is, when you think of all these powers separately on their own, they seem weak. But if you're in the middle of a, a cloud of darkness where dogs are running around, and then suddenly, like, right when you're about to make an advantageous strike, like, you lose control of your arm, suddenly that becomes huge. And that's, mm-hmm. that's exactly what we see here, is that suddenly this power that seemed not so great on its own, um, he's fading in and out of the shadows, people can't see him, people don't notice that he's doing this, so he just has this, this way of turning the tide all on his own. And it's cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the chapter ends as someone sneaks up on Taylor and hits her in the head with a fire extinguisher, which we're not expecting. Very dramatic. Uh, Next chapter, it turns (laughs) out that it was Panacea. Panacea was one of the hostages, just by coincidence. You have to wonder, and I honestly don't remember, so I'm not saying anything that's a spoiler. You have to wonder if this was somehow factored into the 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 benefactor's plan i, I don't I, I i don't i really don't remember so i'm not hinting or anything <laughs> um because like what are the odds that that panacea would be at this bank well uh, the, i mean the only reason I, I wouldn't think that is that the benefactor the boss didn't seem to specifically say it needs to be a bank robbery um and it just, i think they just panacea wanted to go to the bank so i'm gonna chalk this up as terrible awful coincidence but i don't know we'll see yeah yeah we'll see so it turns out that Panacea hacked into Taylor's bugs biologically and did the old looped film trick to help the hostages escape. So basically, Taylor sensed that all the hostages were staying put when in actuality they were running up the stairs in the back. And um, Taylor also can't really control her bugs anymore because there's like this terrible feedback loop. So she's in a pretty bad place. And then Glory Girl, who apparently was the person on the roof, crashes through the window and unnecessarily smashes several things in the bank just to be dramatic, which is pretty funny because she's supposed to be the hero and she's just ruin- <laughs> ruining the bank. It's insured. Um, it's fine. Yeah. 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 It's true. It's, it's not your money people. So when glory girl starts toward Taylor, she, uh, Taylor grabs panacea and ends up pulling a knife on her. And for some reason for me, this was like a line that Taylor crossed I know that she's done plenty of horrible things up to this point in in this arc, but like pull, putting a knife to someone's throat is is a bit of a Breaking Bad moment to me, where it, where it's like you you now you're someone who pulls a knife on someone and puts it to their throat. You know, it's yeah, it's a maybe it's because it's just it's a very visceral type of move. Um, well, what do you th- think, Scott? I think beyond, I, I, first of all, I completely agree with you. Um, but I think beyond just the act of doing it, it's that Taylor's reaction to the fact that she did it seems so cold and uncaring. Like she, in this moment, we don't see her like say to herself, Oh my God, what have I done? Um, it's just literally her description of these events is very, um, you know, factual, like listing the facts. And then I grabbed her. Um, you can see it was a moment of desperation, but she really doesn't think that this is like, that this is something big that she has just done, that this is a line that she's just crossed. Um, it doesn't occur to her. And that to me is more important than the act itself. Yeah. I mean, it, it reminds me of how, when, when they saw all the heroes outside in the first place, she's, She's actually, she's not thinking like, oh no, there's so many of them. We're going to get caught. This is, it, it's all over. She doesn't think anything like that. She, she almost immediately goes into like battle computer mode where she's yep. like, she's like, okay, solutions people. And then, she, and then she proposes the attack. So it's almost like the worst the situation gets. Like <laughs> when the situation isn't actually that bad and she's dealing with high school bullies, she freaks out when she's dealing with people who are trying to kill her. She's like super ice cold about it and able to really just deal with it and think it through very logically yeah um i think there's some realism to that actually because in 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 the former case you're you have just social pressure whereas in the latter case you have like adrenaline pumping through your body and life or death stakes so your your focus becomes very sharp yeah but i think and and i think we're going to see in these next this next chapter though that i think it's more than that because um you know, there's there's very much an understanding of in the moment you make a decision, you haven't thought out the decision, you have to think quickly, and 
you don't you don't have time to deal with the consequences of that decision the 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 uh, psychological consequences of that decision on yourself but as we see as things move forward um it, it she, she just seems to be doubling down um, especially mm-hmm. in the next chapter yeah that's the perfect phrase that she's doubling down or that she's escalating someone someone in the reddit at one point pointed out a theme of escalation and i think that's exactly yeah, what's happening yeah. here that she and it, if there's a problem she, her solution is never to try to try to smooth things over and de-escalate de- de- it's always to esca- escalate so as glory, glory, yeah, glory girl and taylor are going back and forth verbally tattletale arrives the the two sisters were messing with taylor's head but now the professional person who messes with people's head has arrived on scene and Tattletail tells him that she's psychic and that she's um gonna gonna reveal their secrets actually that's the next chapter and in, in this chapter all all Tattletail does is point out how um panacea is messing with taylor's power which is through various bugs on panacea's body so taylor kills those and then she's able to use her power again um we, we get a little hint about who these people are the the new wave superhero team so they're a superhero team with no secret identities so they have full accountability and this is how um everyone knows what you know who panacea is what her secret identity is yeah we've kind of touched on these guys before um in in the interlude i kind of talked about their whole thing a little bit um but it's cool to see them in a much more public sense of action here that um it's just these guys um, they, they with their real names the funny thing is they say they have full accountability but we've also already seen that they don't really um because they've found a way around that like just in the interlude how glory girl acts and um kind of how she acts reckless here too you said she's throwing stuff around the bank because she doesn't care they claim to have full accountability it's very clear that they really do not and they exist kind of on their own yeah and and also they have like personal connections with with the official heroes like glory girl is is in a relationship with gallant for example so right right it all seems very shady actually and, and, and a bit questionable so the next chapter telltale lets on that she knows these secrets about their family because as we recall um panacea and glory girl are adoptive sisters and tattletale says that these secrets would blow their family apart if she spoke them aloud and uh one of these secrets being that tattletale knows who amy's father is which is something that amy doesn't want to know because she's she knows that he's a criminal and she thinks that if she knows who he is for certain then she'll always be thinking about oh, is is that capability in me or that capability for evil or, or what have you um and then tattletale hints that there's something even worse that amy doesn't want spoken um and you can see from looking at the two heroines that this is affecting them like it's not just bs it's it's actually to one degree or another it's um it's getting to them in fact it gets to them so much that panacea decides that it's better for her to take a huge risk than to have this conversation go any longer and she shoves taylor off of her and glory girl goes for it grabs tattletale and throws her at taylor which sounds really painful and uh long story short tattletale tells taylor what to do in order to get through glory girl's shield because tattletale knows that glory girl isn't really invincible she just has a shield around herself that recharges so the shield goes down when tattletale shoots her and then the bugs get all over her and she swarms it probably gets more more messed up by the bugs than anybody else in this chapter actually (laughs) so matt remember in last arc where there was a really mean girl that was uh using some secret information about someone's parents um to make someone really emotionally devastated that would be a really cruel thing to do scott i hope that we don't know anyone who would do something that evil (laughs) yeah um suddenly we're doing it again and the scariest part about this matt is that Taylor's kind of enjoying it too. Like she mm-hmm. can't see the connect. Like she's in on it. She's like, she th- makes lines like, Oh no, now I'm interested too. And like, she's relishing in it. And Tattletail is definitely relishing in it. Like she is like, 
comes off straight up evil here as she's flaunting this information. But Taylor is right there with her, and she's completely unaware. She she's completely unable to see this connection to her personal life. Um, and like, it, it's amazing. Like we we talk about writing and and structure and how that works. That I, now in two episodes we've seen two direct comparisons to this incident from two different angles from the Emma, the, the, I'm talking about the Emma incident. Um, right. Um, from, from two different angles, we've seen this from, um, uh, Taylor putting herself in the position of being attacked again via, um, her reaction, her interaction with Rachel and now being on the absolute other side of it and just not knowing. And yeah. that, that, that like the, when I said doubling down, this is what I meant. Like that she is participating in the same thing that happened to her and is okay with it is yeah. so huge. I, I didn't notice on my first read through, like how much of a toady she's being here, where she's just she, like you just said, she's she's bantering along with Tattletail as she tries to destroy these people's lives. And I mean, you can give her the very slight benefit of the of the doubt or whatever that she's at mortal risk right now, but she's only at mortal risk because she decided to rob a bank. Yeah. So it's not really extenuating. Well, and uh, and again, we're in her head, right? And we're yeah. not seeing in the pros her talking about how, oh my God, like I feel bad about this, like like I understand I'm I'm stuck in this situation, but like what what lisa is doing to these people is so cruel and terrible we don't see that she doesn't say that she is in she is with this she has been caught up in in everything and is going for it um and that that is scary it's also possible that she sees glory girl as a bully so it's okay. Right. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Because Glory Girl is so strong. It's like, well, she's so strong. How could I ever harm her? And and clearly she is. Um, in fact, she harms Glory Girl much worse than Glory Girl harms her. Yeah. Well, and, so. and, and I want to make, like, this is a reaction to the things that have been done to her. This, again, we talked about earlier in the section that this is what bullying does to a person, that um, she has been kind of shoved down this path and she's still making decisions on her own and she's still accountable to those decisions. But I mean, if this whole thing is a parable about the dangers of bullying, then we're seeing it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, and honestly, just for the record, um, I did not notice this thing you're pointing out, but right now where, um, where Taylor is, playing the part of you know maybe Sophia or one of one of Emma's toadies right, and right. and Tattletail is playing the role of Emma that's that's not something i noticed before and that's absolutely spot on i think i think that's i think that's almost certainly intentional because again we have this extremely dominant theme of bullying and we've we've had these same motifs shown again and again so that's that's pretty cool thanks yeah. for pointing that out yeah so um after they take down Glory Girl with their trick, uh, Tattletail and Taylor run outside, join the other villains, and mount the monster dogs and start just heading off into the streets with Gru kind of shooting his darkness all through the side streets and all over the place so that the heroes, even the ones that can fly, can't track where they're going. And as they're riding along, a couple of the villains will drop off their their dogs and, and change into civilian clothes while still immersed in the darkness and Tattletail and Taylor end up just happily strolling down the boulevard arm in arm, agreeing that today was a very good day, <laughs> which I, I just wrote down. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and this is what I'm talking about too, is like, I can understand in the moment you make a decision and it's the wrong decision and you regret it later. But, and, 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 you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the first thing we see in the next arc is Taylor dealing with the psychological guilt of everything that happened. But right now in this moment, like we end with all these terrible things happening with them, you know, skipping down the road into the sunset or something like that. And yeah. I mean, like, damn, dude, like we're, we're in it now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, things have been agitated. 
Yeah, she seems to be fairly over the fact that she traumatized all those people at the bank. Yeah, pre- pretty yeah. quickly. Um, I mean, yeah. it, that, that I mean, like she even she's even rationalizing it herself. She's like, okay, yeah, things didn't go perfect, but I mean, they went okay. No one died. It's like, yeah. oh, no one died, so it's just fine. I guess yeah, no one died. We got we got a lot of money. We had way money, way more money than we expected. <laughs> yeah. and that's it's really a a priority for you there, Taylor. That's interesting. <laughs> did you did you uh, forget what your goal here is? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And and clear and she's clearly just thrilled to be spending time with Tattletail and just yeah. And also she kind of got yeah. to show that she's strong and powerful to her new friends. It's all it's all it's not looking not looking good for for heroin taylor <laughs> um so the the interlude follows and this is it's interesting because there's less it's less clear who the pov is um i don't even know if it has a yeah is a this POV. i think this is are all the interludes third person um i don't think they're, so or maybe they're they mostly are. they're mostly yeah, yeah they're mostly close third person and this is more somewhat omniscient third person where I don't know the correct term, but you're jumping between people or, or you're seeing you're seeing the, the thoughts of different people, I think. Or, or maybe you're not seeing anyone's thoughts necessarily, but you're it's more of a, yeah. a higher level view. And this this interlude is the wards and the heroes returning to the PRT headquarters to meet Director Pigo, which I'm pretty sure is the pronunciation based on my reading of various i'm really tomes. really glad you wrote that because i would have said pig it well that's how i read it for the entire time <laughs> i read the read the thing i'm gonna try to watch out for pronunciations but you know i'm not gonna get them all right so Pigo is super hard on the heroes when they arrive and says this is a fiasco kid win gets in big trouble for using the cannon that he hadn't had properly checked out and vetted and everyone's pay is docked for the property damage and she just really rags on him and uh, it seems to me that this cops and robbers game that Tattletail was describing works out a lot more in favor of the villains, because this just does not sound fun. No, yeah, I mean, they already lost, and now they are responsible for everything. Especially the fact that they get docked pay for what Glory Girl did in the bank. Even though that was none of them, um, they get blamed for it. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like it's not good to be a good guy. Yeah. It's it's uh, a lot more fun to be a bad guy. You almost have to wonder why they even do it, other than like the the right to to run around using the superpowers. <laughs> other than you know, like morals. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, but like think about Vista. She's a twelve year old girl. Like, what is what is compelling her to 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 run out and partic- participate in superhero battles? You know, I, I don't. Yeah, know. I, I guess mean, that's I, I mean, true. I mean, I know, but okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Sneaky bastard. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm not supposed to do that. So the debrief, uh, they they go on to their to their kind of, uh, what's the word? Their base, their secret base, their Batman lair, and they debrief. They they break down the battle on a whiteboard, actually, which I think is a is a really really cool touch that kind of goes to what we've talked about over and over. Kind of the the attempt at at really good realism where. After a battle, you're going to want to do a debrief. You're going to want to put down everything that everybody observed on the whiteboard. You're going to, you know, you basically what they're doing is they're accumulating data on all of the all of the villains and getting ideas on what they can do differently next time. And if nothing else, this highlights the informational advantage provided by Tattletale because they don't, the, the undersiders don't even have to do this. Tattletale is just like, yep, these are all their powers. Oh, by the way, I noticed this at the last battle and that enabled me to know all these other things about them, which, you know, it's completely asymmetrical and, and, uh, yeah. explains why the undersiders win. For sure. Yeah. Um, the thing, the thing that I, this, I'm trying to like, I had a very different opinion of this interlude than the other interludes. I think I, I liked the other two much better. Um, and I think it's probably just because, there's things set up in those that are much more clear um, in that how they're going to pay off into the future. Um, this one in particular, um, I can tell it's setting stuff up, it's building world, it's doing things, but it's very unclear how exactly this is going to pay out. Um, specifically, you know, Gallant's conversation with uh, 
with uh, Panacea, which we haven't actually talked about yet. So I, I skipped ahead a little bit. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot going on here and there's too many faces and you don't really know any of them in the first place. So there's, um, at least in the Glory Girl inter- interlude, you hadn't met her yet, but yeah. you're, in, you're in her head, so you kind of get to know her along the way. Whereas these guys, you're having to get to know like five or seven or whatever different people it's kind of on the fly because you don't really know anything about them yet. So you're just, you can't get in that deep and you can't care that much. And um, it, yeah. it is nice that you get to see the other side of the fence and see that these are people too and see what their lives are like. I will say that uh, Panacea's outpouring of her feeling of responsibility is heartbreaking um, because like that it's, that's so real world and true. Like, like she is a person who can heal anyone, but she can't heal everyone it's impossible and that burden has to be just awful like i can't imagine yeah yeah she's so yeah she just to just to end that out she comes to try to help the heroes and gallant pulls her aside because he senses how upset she is even though she's hiding it and yeah she she has this outpouring about how um she she actually comes to resent normal people because they don't have this burden of constantly feeling responsible for all the suffering that, that she's not healing because she's not awake 24 hours a day, you know, going to hospitals and whatever. And that there's, there's suffering that she could prevent, but she can't be everywhere. Um, yeah, and, she comes, I mean, she's a very complicated character from the little bit we've seen of her. I like the little touches. I like that, you know, she gets really angry and she was kind of nasty. Um, to ta- like she was spitting back at Taylor some nasty stuff like when she had the upper hand or thought she had the upper hand and stuff like that so um she's very complicated and interesting and I'm really looking forward to digging into her a lot more which I'm I'm sure we will do yeah yeah the, she has this this rule about not affecting people's brains for some reason it's like okay that's, that that piques my interest why why does she have that rule um yeah, but so, the, the specific point here seems to be that they're setting up this weird love triangle um, between Glory Girl, uh, Panacea, and, and Gallant, um, which I don't know yeah. if that's... I'm assuming that's going to pay off. I think that's maybe why I don't like it, because I just can't see why in this moment that matters. I mean, I'm sure it will, um, but maybe that's just why I didn't like this one as much, because I just... I can't, I can't see 200 pages down the line or, or whatever, you know? Yeah, maybe that feels tonally inappropriate. But also, I, I I would have a hard time seeing why she would be feeling like feeling this level of desperation about that if that were the the real secret. Because remember, she was so she was so desperate for Tattletale not to say whatever it is that. Yeah, it can't. No, it has to be something else. You're absolutely right. So, um, so tell. Uh, sorry. Uh, Panacea kind of breaks off the conversation at that point and just goes and starts filling in the team on her impression of Tattletail's power, which is interesting because they don't really know what she does exactly still. (laughs) And and she knows everything that they do. They just know that she knows things and that's about it. I mean, she pretended like she was uh, a psychic or whatever, um, which we kind of skipped over that, but apparently that's just something that doesn't truly exist um, with, with, one exception in this world um that like there's all these studies and sayings that someone cannot have as much that enough brain power to do that um we're kind of seeing that that's not true but uh that's a little interesting world building yeah yeah i mean i i that's definitely one of those things that's that's really interesting on on a read through that that they have these justifications for why it's impossible for psychics to exist and then tattletales like there there are tons of parahumans who break the laws of physics why would you why would you give any? Why would you listen to anyone who said that that a superpower can't do something? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that that is arc three agitation. Scott, do you want to introduce our new segment? Yeah. So um, we thought it would be fun because, as everyone knows, I am reading along with this for the first time. So we thought it would be fun for me to make some guesses about what's going to happen in the future. And you guys can all laugh at me when I'm completely wrong or awe in my amazingness when I am totally right, which is probably not going to happen very often. Um, But so we're calling this Scott's Speculations. 
um, because we like alliteration here and we're not very good writers. Um, <laughs> so, um, so each week I'm just going to come at you and I'll try to base them um, off of kind of events that happened in this arc. Um, sometimes it won't be, sometimes it'll be something I thought about in between sessions, whatever. Um, but, but there you go. Um, so I've got, I've got three for you this week, Matt. Um, All right. and, and we need to keep track of these and see how I do. And I will embarrassingly eat crow when I'm wrong, um, on each and every one of them. Yes, we will. We'll have our own tracking document. I'm sure the fans will delight in keeping track as well. Yeah. Cause everyone likes making fun of me. All right. Um, so number one, I am pretty convinced that Taylor and Rachel slash Hellhound slash bits bitch are going to eventually become good friends in some way or another. Um, I think it, it seems to me that that's where we're heading. Like there's, there's a, a very, um, I, I won't say tired, but very used trope there where people meet butt heads, don't get along and then eventually find a way of working things out and becoming friends. Um, not to say doing that would be bad writing here. I don't think that at all. Um, but I think they have a lot more in common as we kind of saw in this, this arc. And that's just, I think where, where we're going with those two characters. So that's guess number one. Um, we'll see. Okay. Um, number two, I'm going to say that Rachel, um, is not one of the two murderers, uh, on the undersiders that, that arms master claimed there to be, um, Taylor, obviously, immediately upon hearing this news says, oh, well, Rachel's the first one, but who could the other one be? Um, it, it seems like that's, to me, kind of too obvious. Um, so I think it, 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 it's going to go in a different direction, and it might be people who we didn't expect. Um, I'm thinking Brian might be a murderer, but um, anyway. Okay, yeah, I, I was going to say, not to put you on the spot, but but could you pick who they are? But the thing is... I feel like there's, I feel like you could make a good case for almost any of them, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you put me on the spot, I would say probably Brian and Alec, but, um, I also completely could see Lisa doing it as well. So, um, I think it could be any of them. I think, I think the reason why it's not Rachel is it just seems too obvious. (laughs) Okay. Um, and then lastly, I am going to make a guess that Lisa Tattletale knows at least something about Taylor's infiltration plans. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate whether she knows exactly what Taylor's doing and what Taylor wants to do, but I'm going to say that Lisa absolutely knows more than she's letting on um, with Taylor um, and I, either is playing a long game or um, or her powers allow her to see something that sees that um, while she thinks she's doing this, um, the truth is something a little bit different. So that's my third and final speculation for this week. Awesome. This, I'm, I'm loving this, uh, this feature. I bet you're sitting there like, like enjoying all of this. I mean, I mean, even if you were sitting across from me, all you would know is that I'm smirking. <laughs> you, you wouldn't know why though. So it's fine. That's, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I might stay out of the subreddit because I bet people are going to just immediately jump in and and tell you which of these are right and which are wrong. But uh, I, I will do that. I try to stay out of there. <laughs> I mean, I, I go into hours because some people uh, reference things I said directly and I want to respond to them. But I think this week I will put that burden on your shoulders um, and let you do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll at least uh, um, field things for you. Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, well. That that concludes our third episode of this of this feature. Um, so yeah, we we, we, went, uh, we went a little long tonight, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> and that's yeah. We're, I mean, I, I think you know, for a little inside the the studio thing, um, Matt and I are still trying to find a way as these arcs get longer and longer, how we're gonna do this. Um, because I, as you can see, we're at, I think we're at an hour and 30 something minutes right now. Um, we definitely, we, our goal was 90 minutes. <laughs> Obviously we're breaking that today. Um, I don't think we want to do more than two hours for sure, but there's going to be a time Matt, where these arcs are book sized and I, I want to be able to both cover it in an amount of time that makes it listenable to people because asking people to listen for two hours is a big commitment. Um, but also that, um, 
allows us to still dive into some stuff and talk about it in the level of detail that people are accustomed to. So that's something we're going to have to figure out. And um, we're kind of <laughs> kind of putting that off until we're pulling the tailor here and just compartmentalizing that away and dealing with it when we get there. Yeah, I mean, please give us feedback, and uh, even if it's even if it's inconsistent feedback, because um, if if you want us, if if it's widely okay with people that we not cover the intricate details of superhero battles, then maybe we will severely underemphasize those. On the other hand, if people love hearing us go through those, then we'll we we will talk about those in in detail. Um, you know, we're we want to make this valuable and entertaining and we want to make it kind of evergreen in the sense that i want somebody to be able to stumble across this a year from now or or even longer and still be able to listen to these and, and enjoy them because um we you know we made them we made them right the first time so yeah absolutely that's why, that's why we love feedback we love to to make the best the best thing we can make yes please keep um, the feedback coming we love it we absolutely love it um, yeah. especially when you tell me how awesome i am i really enjoy that yeah so just yeah. keep doing that please yeah yeah, it's it's good. We, we we thrive on it. So so as always, um, let us know if you have any advice on Twitter, Reddit, as a comment on our dailyplanetfilms dot com website, via email or in our Facebook group. Uh, we also have a Patreon page, and we now have one donor, which is a uh, which is a milestone for us. Oh yeah, uh, do we have that name? I forgot to we, pull that up. I can I can pull that name up really really quickly. Unprofessional pause. Oh, wait, we got two patrons. Oh, we did? Yeah. Wait, you're already there? Yeah, I'm here. Wow. Um, we have, it looks like a $1 donation and a $4 donation. Oh, my God. Yeah, so so we, we, we've put together some, uh, um, what's the word, some, some goals and some reward structure. We haven't posted them yet, um, but we will do that. And then it will be clear what our plans are with this podcast. And, um, and, um, how we might be able to make some really fun things that involve audience, particip- audience participation if we do get a little bit of donation. Yeah. I think, you know, to be perfectly honest, we threw up the Patreon, um, and we kind of set it up and then let it sit. Um, now that we've actually got a couple people donating, you're absolutely right. We're going to invest time in planning what our goals are, what our rewards are, um, how we thank you guys. Um, one of the ways we thought to thank you was to read your names on the podcast, but we, we don't have those, so we can't do that. Um, we'll do it next week, right, Matt? Yeah, we'll do it next week. Um, we'll, we'll catch everybody. But for those of you guys that have donated, thank you so much. That's so nice of you. Like that's That means the world to me that you would be willing to help us out in what we do here, and that's that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Totally. And while you're on Patreon, don't forget to donate to Wildo because he does this for a living. And uh, we're kind of riding on his coattails here. And we, uh, <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, and, and, I, and I donate to him because I love Twig and, and I want to be able to read Worm too. And uh, it's everybody wins. Uh, so, Scott, where can you be found on the Internet? I am on Twitter uh, at ScottDaily85. If you follow me, you can see a lot of really snarky comments about the new Netflix show uh, Iron Fist. I did not like that at all, and I've been tweeting about it a lot as I watch it these past few days. Um, you can also find me at DailyPlanetFilms.com, where this podcast, every other podcast we do, and all of our writing on TV, books, movies is. Uh, that's DailyPlanetFilms.com. Yep. And I can be found on Twitter at More Than a Mail. And if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to listen to some of our other episodes, I would recommend uh, the Deconstructing series where Scott and I and maybe a guest now and then uh, deconstruct some famous and great director. Uh, we've done, I think, maybe five or six of them at this point. Those are always really fun. Um, we have a bunch of different series um, but that's that's one of the ones that I think is 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 good. Yeah, I um, think our Wes Anderson one might still be my favorite one. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I I will agree with you there. So, and they're all they're all called like deconstructing deconstructing Wes. I think is that one. Yeah, we um, try to go yeah. last name, but deconstructing Anderson doesn't mean anything. So we yeah. had to go had to go with yeah. the first name on that one. But we've done yeah, we've done Tarantino, we've done Chris Nolan. Um, I know uh, we've done Neil Blomkamp. Yeah, Blomkamp. That was a fun one because we don't really like him. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But yeah, that's a good series too. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's all for today and we will see you next week. <laughs>